Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Of course, I'm Sheila Huggins. We're at Millennium Gym in Durham. Thank you again, Patrick, for hosting this. And we have lots of our judicial candidates with us. So this is going to be an opportunity for you to hear directly from them in this informal setting, even though they look awesome, more awesome than me. But I'm going to go down the row here. I think I'm going to start with Anita. Let her tell us who she is, what she's running for, and why people should be really interested in making sure they get behind the judicial candidates in this election. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, my name is Anita Earls. I'm running statewide for the North Carolina Supreme Court. And I think it's so important that people pay attention to the judicial races because the decisions that they make, the courts make really impact everyone's lives. All right, and then we have Toby who's running for one of the Court of Appeals seats. And we've got three candidates who are actually running for the Court of Appeals seats. So when you guys introduce yourselves, sort of help people understand because sometimes even I can't follow that. Now Judge Arrowwood is already on the Court of Appeals but there are three seats. So explain how that works as you're sort of going through this. Yeah. Absolutely, well, hi, I'm Toby Hampson. I'm running for what will be designated as seat number two uh, on the ballot uh, for the Court of Appeals this fall. It is a statewide race as well. It's the seat that's being vacated by uh, Judge Calabria. All of each of us are running for individual seats on the court. So it's important that you vote in, in really well, all four of these statewide races. You know, this is a blue moon election in which uh, uh, the only statewide race is our Court of Appeals to State Supreme Court. And so uh, I practice uh, law in Raleigh. Uh, I'm a board certified specialist in appellate practice. I'm clerked at the court and I've been in private practice for about 14 years, focusing on cases in the Court of Appeals to State Supreme Court. Um, I'm running because really, now more than ever, we need judges who have the right experience, real hands on experience handling these really complex issues that come before. And secondly, we need judges now who are committed to an independent judiciary, uh, judges who understand that the judicial branch is in fact a co-equal branch of government under our Constitution, and who are willing to provide uh, everybody uh, their day in court with fairness, respect, and civility to provide the justice they deserve. Awesome. Thank you. Judge Arrowwood. I'm Judge John Arrowwood, and I'm running to retain my seat on the Court of Appeal. It will be seat number one on your ballot. Uh, I have been on the court for about an almost a total of three years by the time the election is in two separate terms. Uh, I clerked at the court. I was a staff attorney and a senior staff lawyer there. I practiced in Charlotte for over 26 years doing civil, commercial, employment, and administrative type regulation law. Uh, I believe that it is important that we have folks who have experience and folks who have a, a proven record of what kind of a judge they will be based upon what they've done in their life. And I have that proven record that there are 180 opinions or more that I've drafted over my time and I invite you to go look at them and see what, what kind of a judge I am. Hi, I'm Allegra Collins. I too am running for the Court of Appeals. I'm running for seat number three, Judge Elmore's seat. Judge Elmore's been on our court for 16 years uh, and he will be missed. But, uh, but I am uh, I'm working hard. I would love to be at the Court of Appeals, and I just want to give a special shout out to my students at Campbell Law School. I teach judicial writing there, I teach appellate advocacy, uh, and I manage the externship program. Uh, and I also practice in our Court of Appeals in the Supreme Court. Okay. So these are really important races. They are statewide, so we are on everybody's ballot in North Carolina. All right, so now that we've sort of, sort of introduced ourselves, so here's the deal, okay? A lot of times people get really concerned about the presidential elections when they come up every four years and they get very interested in like the local election, who's running for sheriff or who's running for mayor. And a lot of times people just aren't that interested in who's running for judge, okay? And as each of you introduced yourselves, it's evident that you come to these um, positions with a lot of experience. So to some extent, we need to sort of bring this back down to a level where people understand how this impacts their daily lives. Because really, sometimes that's the piece that's missing. It's sort of like, okay, well, they all sound like they're experienced, but what does it mean to me here when I get up and I, you know, I gotta take my child to school and I gotta take my mom to the doctor's office. Like, what's the really big deal here? Why does this really, truly, matter? What's going to get people out of their homes and get them out to vote for you? So let's start on this end this time. All right, so the judicial races are important. We have seen a lot of cases recently go to the courts, be decided by the courts, and it's really important to have both judges who are experienced and 
fair and impartial, a fair deciding case is that they affect everybody's lives. We're talking about child custody, we're talking about property disputes, we're talking about life, liberty, money, things that affect everybody every day. And it's really important to have judges who will take the time and be thoughtful uh, to make these decisions that affect everybody's lives. Uh, well, been there. The Court of Appeals actually is the Court of Last Resort for many appeals. The Supreme Court doesn't take as many appeals as the Court of Appeals. There are about between 14 and 1,500 cases a year come to the court and they involve child support. They involve every criminal case other than a case where a death sentence has been rendered for someone appeals. They involve very, all the civil cases except for certain business court cases. They involve things that affect everybody's everyday life. And there are cases that are important to the litigants every day. And that's what we have to keep our focus on, is while we may not be making new law in every case, it's important to the litigants that that case be decided correctly. And that's why you need folks who have a broad base of experience, and who had, a, like me, who's had private practice experience, and who has a record that what one can do as a judge. Yeah, and really building on what, what Judge Arrowwood said, you know, the, the Court of Appeals in particular has a direct impact in the day-to-day -day lives of, of all North Carolinians. You know, it decides cases from, from all over the state, all 100 counties, in, in, in practically every area of the law. So, so yes, if you are charged with a crime, the Court of Appeals is going to impact your life. If you are an injured worker or an employer, the Court of Appeals is going to impact your life. If, you, uh, if you're a consumer or a business, the Court of Appeals decisions are going to impact your life directly because the decisions of that court really do govern the, the decisions in the trial judges all across the state, and that's in every area of law, including family law. So if you're, if you're a, a parent, if you're a, a husband, wife, a consumer of health care, those decisions will directly impact, uh, impact your life and the lives of all North Carolinians, and that's why it's so, so important. Uh, to, to vote in these races and vote for people with experience. And we're all consumers of health care. We are all consumers of health care, <laughs> whether we want to be or not. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And so, Anita, you're in somewhat of a different position because you're the one that's running for one of, for the Supreme Court seat. So tell us from your perspective. So there, we have a seven-member Supreme Court. There's only one seat on the ballot this year. I really think that the reason why I decided to run is the same as the reason why voters should care. So for 30 years I've been a civil rights attorney and the reason I decided to step away from representing individuals and seek a seat on the court is because given what I've seen as a civil rights attorney, what's happening at the federal level with our federal courts, I think our state constitution and our state courts are going to be a strong avenue of protection of our rights um, in the near future. And so whether that's your employment rights, whether that's um, rights that, that people have when they're charged with crime, whether it's your civil rights, your right to vote, um, right to housing, all of the things that um, impact your daily life, I think they can, those decisions can happen at the state court level and that it's an important forum going forward. Tell people something that they may not know about you. It's like, yes, you're running, for the North Carolina Supreme Court, but what's that one thing that people may not know about you as you're going through this race that, that you think matters in terms of who you are as a person? Well, thank you, yes. So I um, grew up in a mixed race family. My father's black, my mother's white. And people may not realize that when my parents uh, met and fell in love in Missouri, it was actually illegal for them to be married. Uh, it wasn't until I was seven years old that the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled in a way that invalidated those laws across the country. So that um, really gave me a sense of how it's possible to use the law to get us closer to equal justice. And it's really been uh, my personal experience seeing the barriers that my family and my community has faced that inspired me to become a civil rights attorney in the first place. Well, well, for me, it's it's uh, really bringing a sense of, of, of North Carolina. I'm, I'm not a native-born North Carolinian, but I did grow up largely down in, in Moore County, uh, attending schools like Sand Hills Farm Life Elementary and, and Union Pines. Uh, actually, I graduated from high school here in Durham from the School of Science and Math, and, and then went to law school in Harnett County. Um, and so now I live, practice, and raise a family in Wake County. And so I think that's really, uh, 
uh, instilled me with a sense of, 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 of this state and of the people of the state and the importance of uh, the judiciary all across the state of North Carolina, which again is why the Court of Appeals is so important. Judge Erwood. Well, I was born in Yancey County. Um, neither of my parents had a college degree. In fact, I was the first person in my family to obtain a four-year college degree. My parents died when I was 15, and I went to live with my brother, who at that time was a state trooper in Lenore, North Carolina, with my brother and sister-in-law and his six-month-old daughter, and I lived with them through law school at where I went to Chapel Hill. I am, when I was initially appointed to the court, and I still am the only openly LGBTQ statewide office holder in the state, and so I have seen the way that the law can help protect equality for folks, and that's something that I believe is critically important for North Carolina. You might know this, but I, uh, I love sports. I'm a big sports fan. I'm a big Hurricanes fan, and I grew up playing sports. I played lots of different sports, soccer and basketball, and I played tennis uh, at UCLA, and I uh, also played professionally and represented the United States twice in the Pan American Games in a sport called team handball which is the second most popular team sport in the whole world behind soccer. But we don't know, Didn't know that in the US. <laughs> so uh, it's a fantastic sport. If you Google team handball, you get to watch one. But I play goalie, which is uh, the crazy position. But, uh, but uh, I love sports, and I really bring the, the hard work and the dedication and the commitment. Um, those things that I grew up doing in sports is what I had done in the law and what I would bring to the court. And it really, um, additionally, is teamwork. You don't really think about teamwork when you think about judges. But uh, but the Supreme Court is seven judge justices, and the Court of Appeals is 15 judges, and we would sit in pans of three. And it is important to collaborate. It is important to be able to give and take, and to criticize, and to bounce ideas, and to work as a team when you're working as a panel. So I think that that's an important uh, quality to be able to bring to both courts. So I want to open it up and just make it a little bit more conversational so people can just sort of hear you know, your take on things. And whoever wants to go first gets to go first. Toby does. Sure, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> well, you know, for me, it, it comes back to fundamentals. You know, it really comes back to, to this, this concept that, you know, we've been really, really lucky in North Carolina and really fortunate to have a bench and bar that has been incredibly clean, you know, particularly relative to, to other states. But I think in, in you know, in this era of, sort of the social media discourse and the political discourse, you know, it's something that we as a legal profession and, and we as judicial candidates have to have to be very careful to preserve and maintain. It's not something we can take for granted. So I think it's really important that, that we as a profession uh, really focus on, on the collegiality and civility uh, within our courts. And I think that in itself leads to, to a level of an independent judiciary. Um, you know, that, that frankly, we, we should be proud of here we've really done a good job doing that, but we've got to work to maintain it. So you said something, and I, I want to um, clarify that for people who may be watching later, because not everybody understands what we mean when we say an independent judiciary. Like, we know what we're talking about, but, um, you know, help, help listeners sort of understand what that really means and why that's even important. Well, it's important because there are three co-equal parts of government in North Carolina. And it is very important that each of those branches be able to do the job that, that the Constitution gives them to do without any interference. And it's also important that we have a judiciary that is not dependent upon money from the special interest, it's not dependent upon things. We used to have in North Carolina public financing for campaigns, but the legislature has done away with that. We used to have nonpartisan elections. The legislature has done away with that. So it's absolutely critical that you have a judiciary that's not beholden to another branch of government and a judiciary that's not beholden to any special interest money that can decide the cases as we have taken oath to do without favoritism to any party or to the state consistent with the Constitution of North Carolina and of the United States and the laws thereof.
Yeah, but the other thing I want to add is that we're talking about money, and all of the candidates running in the races um, have to ask for money because we have to fund campaigns. So um, the other thing is to look at an individual's ability to rule without fear and favor, to uphold the law, even if that might subject them to criticism, even if it means that at some point they might not be elected again because it wasn't the popular decision. But the ability to rule fairly and accurately based solely on the law, and that's a personal point of pride, I think it's important when we're looking at an independent judiciary because it is hard to cut through the noise of partisan elections and fundraising and money and uh, endorsements. Well, I think having an independent judiciary means the rules are the same for everyone. And that right now we really do face a very serious threat to the independence of our judiciary in the state because of the actions that the North Carolina legislature has taken. And in particular, um, there is a constitutional amendment proposed on the ballot that would change how judges are appointed when there's a vacancy. And that would allow the legislature to essentially to appoint uh, instead of the governor. And there have been, in, in, the, in my race, the North Carolina General Assembly has passed five separate laws seeking to impact the outcome of this election. And my view is the voters should be the ones who choose who wins this election, not the North Carolina General Assembly. I think it's, I think, I think it's telling that you've got four candidates here who, who are all committed to that, that concept of an independent judiciary. You know, I think that, that that's the kind of consistent message we need across across the board, frankly, from, from all judicial candidates, irrespective of, of, of partisan labels or anything else. And so, so I, think it's, I think it's really important that the four of us can sit here and, and, and stand for that, and uh, stand for an independent judiciary. Yeah, and so you mentioned the constitutional amendments. Well, let me, since I raised the topic of the amendments, <laughs> yeah. let me jump in here yeah. and say that the amendment that deals with the administration of justice, how judges are selected, that's one that judges do have a right to comment on. Okay. For the other amendments, what I can say is that there are a lot of sources of information out there. Um, a lot of groups, uh, both the partisan groups as well as nonpartisan groups, that are working to get information to the public about what those amendments mean, what impact they might have, and it's, a, it's just public knowledge. Yesterday, day before yesterday, five of our former governors um, had a press conference and gave their view of two of the amendments and have filed a brief in court in some of the litigation over the amendments. So I actually think that there is a lot out there for the public to access and that it, it's not too hard. There'll be a lot of, um, in the media, on social media, there'll be a lot of information. So it, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out what the different positions are on the amendments. And the League of Women Voters does it usually does a really good job of pushing out information. Folks just need to find it, read it, and look at it. And But to understand it and to talk to folks um, about what the ramifications of the various amendments are. What are you doing to sort of, you know, do you have any way that you're working specifically to sort of reach out to younger voters? Well, I think that social media has played a big role uh, in all different kinds of campaigns. Uh, I think the younger generation is, for the most part, on some sort of social media, so be, being able to engage with them in social media, I think, has, uh, has helped a lot. Uh, and uh, also just speaking with groups, speaking with school groups, um, speaking with students at, at Campbell Law School and, and, and others, and, and getting the word out that it is important to vote, um, and, and that there is a lot of opportunity to vote. Lots of people have worked hard to get early voting sites, to get early voting dates and times, um, and so the opportunity is there, uh, and, and they should take advantage of it. Well, I actually think there are a lot of voter education tools that are, um, you know, pushing text messages mm -hmm. and showing up on people's phones. Um, but I would say, so because the right to vote is so important to me, I have made it a high priority to have a very grassroots campaign. And I have field organizers in several parts of the state who will be reaching out to college campuses. Um, so there's definitely an effort to engage young people. You have to, my view is, you have to sort of understand what their issues and concerns are and meet them where they are. Um, and for judges in particular, that's, a, I think, in many ways really hard. Um, but I think when, when you, 
a, a lot of people are talking about this as a justice election um, because not only are judges being elected, but district attorneys and sheriffs in a lot of counties. Um, so the people who uh, run the justice system are at the choice of the voters. And, and I think getting young people to understand um, or, or see the intersection with their lives is an important. Well, I think it's also critical in, in these judicial races in particular for to be able to educate folks to not just vote the congressional race or not just vote the legislative race because of another ruling that the legislature made which moved these races to the bottom of the partisan ballot. And so it's critical for us to be able to educate not only young people but everybody that they need to vote all the way down. And one reason that some people would cynically say that things are moved to the bottom of the ballot is because there's a drop off as people right. as people vote and they drop off there's a drop off and so we've got to educate folks that it's important to vote all the way to the bottom and to vote on the constitutional amendments which will be even below that yeah. and in counties where there are paper ballots that may be on the back of the ballot so ah. So there are, it's not just voter fatigue, it's you actually have to... You have to turn them over yeah. and do those things. So it's really important for folks to be educated and to understand that they have to vote the entire ballot all the way through the constitutional amendments. One of the things that you mentioned, and I said this earlier um, this year at an event I was attending, um, you mentioned social media. And, you know, so there's still all this hoopla to some extent about Russia, but I keep, you know, one of the things um, I told the students over at Duke was, we, you know, if you ever question the power of social media, like that should have answered that for you. Because to the extent that you have another country saying that they're going to use social media to influence a presidential election, that really tells you how you can use that to impact the lives of everyone in terms of getting them out to vote. So that's definitely, we, we're not at the, at the VR stage, but at least we're at the social media stage. That's why we're here with you. So that you can share <laughs> on social media. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and I think what, what's incredible about uh, younger voters is, is because they've uh, kind of come of age in this era of social media, in this era of, of being able to get on Google or, or, or other platforms to, to do their own research, you know, they're they're they, they have a much greater ability to, to weed out uh, sort of falsehoods and, and untruths and do make their own judgments. They're, you know, it's it's not enough just to spoon feed people anymore. Um, and I think I think that's something that, that number one is really encouraging. And number two, the other thing that's encouraging is the sheer amount of energy uh, within our younger voters right now. I think they're probably more energized than ever. But we're also seeing that translate. We're seeing that translate into, into younger candidates across the board, oh, yeah. a lot of first-time uh, candidates and across the state and, and nationwide. And that's been something that's, that's been, you know, frankly, inspiring to me and gives me a lot of hope. And, and I think that's what, in a lot of ways, kind of gets all of us out of bed is to go talk to some of these younger, engaged voters every day. But when you look at how easy or hard is it to vote, I think um, we should not take um, for granted the resource we have in North Carolina, which is early voting, right? So, so beginning October 18th, you can go and vote pretty much nine to five in most counties. Um, and many counties have, all counties have some Saturday voting, many have Sunday voting. And the beauty of early voting is that if there's any problems with your voter registration, or if you haven't registered, or if you've moved and didn't change your registration, you can correct all of that at early voting because you can register and vote at the same time. And so that's an enormous resource that we have here in North Carolina that um, I really encourage people to take advantage of. Yeah, that, that's definitely that's one of those point. things I think sometimes people don't think about. In my house, we always did this thing where we all went on election day together, mm -hmm. like yeah. that was this big right. thing. And now I'm just like, oh no, we're doing early voting. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any other thoughts on that? Yeah. All right, you guys gotta be a little bit more excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut this part out. Yeah. No, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> like this is why they're running for judicial. That's right. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, we want to read. I know, no, right? It's true. We want to sit in a room with a closed door and read and write. That's <laughs> not what we're running to do. Oh, well, I think it's useful to address this question of trust in our elections process. You mentioned Russia and meddling, but it's not only that they put things out over social media, but there's there is now you know law enforcement investigation of how. Um, certain states' election rolls have been um, hacked, and and one of the concerns about um, allowing overseas voters to vote by email is that those right. that that, uh, that can potentially be intercepted and the, the um, results altered. So, so putting resources and that's um, you know intellectual capital, smarts as well as money behind ensuring the integrity of our elections process so that people have faith and confidence that when they go to vote, their vote will count and it'll count equally to everyone else's. I think that's an important step in our democracy that we shouldn't overlook. Well, and, and to build on that and sort of highlight the importance of the judicial races again, you know, uh, oftentimes it's the courts who are going to protect our right to vote. It's the courts who are going to have the final say in uh, how, how this plays out and then including in any criminal prosecution that may, may arise uh, out of that, including any uh, uh, gerrymandering issues and everything else. And so that's another reason why, on a very fundamental level, you know, it is important that you know who you're voting for to be your judges in this state. Well, it's also critical, to go back to early voting, it is absolutely critical that we have voting available to the largest number of people for the to make it convenient to pe for people to vote. And that's why it's great that we have the early voting we have and why folks need to take advantage of it and be able to vote early. And as Anita said, if there's an issue with your registration, it can be fixed at early voting. It can't be fixed on the day that you, if you're voting on election day. So if you think there's a problem with your, your registration or if you've moved and you haven't changed, go vote early. Go vote where, when you can have the things change and when it's perfectly fair, legal, and all for that to happen. And so that's really critical as to what and to why there's been such a fight, I think, over early voting and where it is and in what communities it is and what the hours are and whether there's Sunday voting or Saturday voting and those kinds of things. And I believe that we are in a pretty good space right now about availability. Uh, based upon what the Board of Elections did in the last, or Board of Ethics and Elections did in the last meeting they had. So take advantage of it. I encourage you to go vote early. One of the things I wanted to ask you um, was whether or not there had been some sort of, you know, maybe challenge or something that popped up since you've filed that maybe you hadn't anticipated. And not necessarily anything bad, but maybe just, wow, you know, I hadn't considered this. Well, I would say that it all stands out to me as, wow, I thought I knew what I was undertaking, but I had no idea what a statewide judicial race would 100 be. 100 like. counties. It's a big state. There are so many counties. There are so many people. There are so many events. There are so many questionnaires. There are so many emails. The, the, the sheer magnitude of running a statewide campaign is is overwhelming best uh, and so I don't think I, I understood that but I also didn't understand it until I did it when people have run the race said you meet so many people and you do you just you meet so many nice people uh, and so for as hard as it is it's worth it to get to meet the people and to get to talk about the court uh, that we love and I have have so much admiration for everybody who's run an election and won or lost because you don't know it until you do it. Uh, and so um, so I think that, that just the whole situation was interesting. Am I one of those nice people? <laughs> <laughs> Some days. Fair. <laughs> but yeah, it is. Well, and uh, you know, and just to sort of piggyback on what you said, I, I think people sometimes take for granted. Um, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, these are just politicians or these are just people who are really self-interested in pushing a certain agenda. And really, maybe people don't understand what you actually give up to do this, you know? This is time away from your family, time away from other things that you could be doing. It impacts your health. 
when you're on the road like this consistently, you're having to talk to people nonstop. So if you're an introvert, after a while, it's like, okay, wait, I need to recharge my battery. Can I just get like 10 minutes? You know? And so there is a commitment on your part, but there is also a lot that you give up. And, and like you say, you know, a lot of times you've known people who run before, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, thank you for running. People say, thank you for running. And, and, and you've probably told other people that too, right? And then now you're in it and you're like, oh my gosh, thank you, all of you who've ever run before, right? It's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. That's true. And in fact, today I just sent my judge, Judge Stevens, a text and I said, I apologize again for not understanding how difficult this was because you did it with such grace and poise. And she did it three times. Uh, and so you do give up a lot and it is and it is hard. And I think maybe I speak for just me, but I think I speak for others who would just prefer to do the job <laughs> without the campaign. Because they're yeah. very diametrically opposite. Yeah. What you need to do to win and be an extrovert versus maybe what we all want to do, which is be an introverted thinker. Well, it really is two, as I only half jokingly say, it really is two full, if you're, if you're a sitting judge, it's two full-time jobs because I carry a full caseload, I do everything that any other judge on the Court of Appeals does, and I run a statewide race. And all the other folks who've been there do the same thing. And so it's, it's two, and you're, it's just a lot of work. <laughs> there's just, there's that, and, and now that the race is, there's no longer public financing, it's even more work because you also have to raise the funds to do it. And so that's, that's an additional layer on what judicial races didn't used to be or hadn't been for a while when they did away with public financing. Because there you had to raise a certain amount to show you were viable and then there was a certain amount of other money. And by the way, it wasn't money funded by the taxpayers, it was money funded by lawyers who paid 50 bucks more each year on their bar dues in order to support this. And so it's raising the money, it's being where, everywhere that you can be, and it's doing the job in the office full yeah, time. That's and, a lot. And to get, and to get the word, and to, and to get your work out timely. And, and that's one of my big things is I want everything to appear out of my office at the same time as even I wasn't running. And so that's, that's what makes it a, an interesting task. Well, and that's a high standard to hold for yourself. I guess I have a slightly different take on it in that I really have been doing civic engagement work from the nonpartisan side um, for most of my career as a voting rights attorney. And so now I feel like I'm doing the same thing, but from a partisan Side, that is encouraging people to vote, telling them why voting matters, and it's really, I consider it a real privilege to have this opportunity. Um, and so the other thing I'll, I'll answer though is you asked kind of what, what, what unexpected things have happened. Um, and for me, it, it, it blows me away every time I go to a county and I, um, I'm, I'm at an event and I talk about why I'm running for office and my background, and someone will come out and say, oh, you remember when, the, I remember when you represented me in this case. Oh, wow. Um, and sometimes that has happened in rooms of 500 people, and it just, it just like makes my heart, it's like I'm getting to see all of the communities that I've worked in for 30 years, and people coming forward and saying, here's how my life is different because of the work that you've done, so that's just been, incredibly gratifying and however the election turns out to have had that opportunity and that experience is really I'm really grateful for it. And for me I think one of the, the big things about running a statewide campaign and I mean and I was I was in Brunswick County on the coast on, on Saturday night and Buncombe County uh, in the mountains on, on Sunday afternoon um, but you know, and in that long drive, I had lots of time to reflect. <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that this campaign has driven home for wow. me is it's sort of maybe the silver lining on judicial elections, which is it really does force uh, us as, as candidates who want to be statewide judges to actually get out and know the state, get out to understand the different challenges to the legal uh, communities all around the state, get to understand the different issues, the different communities, and, and the way the different communities deal with those different issues all around the state. And so I think it's just been really important for me um, to travel a bit around the state and get to know get to know the state better if I am going to be a, a judge on the Court of Appeals, which does decide cases from all over the state. And just to add to that, I 
just to piggyback on that, Justice Evans wrote a really great blog a while back about the silver lining of, uh, of judicial elections. And the other one is that, that we educate people about the courts. It isn't every day that somebody comes in and wants to talk about the court of appeals in the Supreme Court. We all talk about it all day. Right. But to be able to go in to explain the different levels that we've got in our system and what each one does and what it is that we want to do as a judge and why it's important, I think um, is, is really a, a very important part of what we're doing as judicial candidates. Yeah, and I, I think you're really right about that because even as I was sort of talking to people and saying, hey, we're going to be at the gym and you know, here are the candidates who are going to be there, people would say, oh, wait, okay, so that's the Durham they're running for, is that district court? And I'm saying, okay, so let's sort of, let, no, this is actually, and so yeah, so if you aren't in the court system, then for you, you don't really understand those different layers. And so, yeah, by running, you're actually educating people about what the actual structure looks like in terms of the judiciary system. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how many times a day do you get asked, well, can I vote for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in your district. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Actually, I'm not in your district. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah, so there is an educational component to this, which is, which is really and you talked a little bit about family, but do the rest of you want to talk about family and anything like that that sort of sticks out that you might want to share with people? And I'm not leaving you out, I'm just saying we can, you, you can speak to it too again, but yeah. Yep, I, uh, I have a son who started high school yesterday. Ah, okay. so that was a big deal. Freshman. Uh, freshman in high school. And then I have a daughter who is five and who will start kindergarten in two weeks. Oh, wow. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a new school for each and it's been both great for them. They've been involved. They've been excited. They got to choose my colors. Uh, they've, they've done, you know, they've driven around and looked at signs. They have uh, enjoyed lots of this, and yet um, it has also been hard to miss things. It's been hard not to put them in bed. It's been hard to miss band concerts. It's been hard to miss swim meets. And so I, I look forward to not missing uh, those things on November 7th and beyond. So it is a sacrifice. I think it's worth it. It's uh, it, for me. It's it's really important for my kids to see um, that I'm out there fighting, working hard for equality and justice and to do something that that's important. Um, but I also look forward to getting home. Yeah, and it's and, and one of the things you just sort of said is that's sort of how we um, that sort of inoculate the next generation from not being involved by having them be involved in their parents' lives when they're going through these campaigns. And so it's sort of like, okay, so tell me again, mommy, you're running for what? And, and who are these other people? And what's the, and so yeah, so your son's a freshman. So yes, so there's, a, so, so as, because I grew up in a political family, and so you grow up knowing about, you know, community issues and that, yes, the city's responsible for this and the county's responsible for this. And so it makes you more of an engaged, you know, resident in your community and, and a more knowledgeable voter. So yeah, that sacrifice, but then the family sort of getting something out of it. And, and children make the best campers. Oh yeah. Because who's going to say no to that? So. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. No. Um. No sort of uh, child labor. Well, right. <laughs> right. Fair. 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 No. And so well, I, I have I have three daughters, uh, uh, ages eight, six, and three, and uh, and. Incredibly understanding wife, uh, who who is is helping me with this campaign uh, in an incredibly hands-on fashion and hugely supportive. But and she's doing it while running her own offer, uh, full time, practicing, practicing full time, and, and, and basically raising our, our three daughters. And so, you know, we've been we I've, I've been incredibly fortunate to have have that support. How old are your daughters? Uh, they're eight, six, and three. Okay. So eight, six, and three. yep. So rising fourth grader, first grader, and preschool. Um, so, uh, you know, and it's been really fun to have them on the campaign trail too, and, um, you know, with their little Toby Hampson I know. t shirts. I, and and I've so. seen people before, it's like my dad's, so, yeah. you know, running for it. Those are Ooh. always really cute. It's like, oh, you just got like 10 votes with that towel <laughs> running around with that on. Which yeah. is another thing that my incredibly understanding <laughs> wife uh, has taken care of on the campaign trail. <laughs> well, I'm different in that I am single, and uh, which, makes the, which makes my schedule a little better. Um, but I'm, uh, as I said, our, I think I said our parents died when I was when I was 15. I went to live with my brother, 
he is now retired to the mountains, and uh, he had one daughter, my niece, who was a lot like my little sister because she was six months old when I moved in with them, and her daughter is now a senior at Chapel Hill, and I just got a text from her today. I'm excited about the fact that she got her first interview for for her med for med school, oh, and wow. so she's. Okay. I've been going through with her taking the MCATs and applying to med school, and she was happy to text me today to say that she just got her first interview application. So, but um, it is. Um, for folks who have small children, I don't see how you do it. I, I, I don't see, and uh, and your spouses have got to be just uh, absolute angels. <laughs> yeah, I will add that my husband is home with the children, young, and uh, he's unbelievably supportive. He's run his own race. He's a Superior Court judge uh, and understands very well the difficulty in running a race, and there it is. But not only does he understand that I need to go, but he shows me out the door because he knows that I need to go. And y'all just celebrated an anniversary. Well, yes. Yeah, so I have two sons and two grandkids. So oh, okay. um, I don't have the childcare responsibilities <laughs> in the same way. Um, but but I also want to share with folks that um, my family has impacted why I'm running for office in a different way, and and that has to do with the fact that um, 12 years ago my brother was murdered, and the person who uh, murdered him was never brought to justice. And so I have a real sense of what that means and what that feels like when the justice system doesn't work the way it should. And that's part of what it motivates me to want to try to, to do better. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so so the continuum is, is very broad there in terms of having small, young kids, having older kids, and then having sort of surrogate kids. <laughs> because, I mean, and, and that's truly what it is. Like, you don't have to have the kid right there in your home to impact, right, their future. And so voters get to see that and know that, you know, you're not just doing things right here, but you're, you know, influencing other people around you as you go about your daily life. What would you say um, to people who are sort of thinking, and we've touched on this a little bit, but are sort of thinking, you know, I, I'm still going to step out of this. You know, I'm still not sure. What do you, what do you, what do you say to that? Well, I understand why some people feel like their vote doesn't matter, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and the first thing I'll say is that um, if you feel that way because you think that the system is rigged, that gerrymandering has put you in a safe district and it doesn't matter who you vote for, the outcome's determined, that is not true for the statewide races. Um, you know, as, as, as a Democrat, I need every Democrat in every county to come out and vote. Um, and particularly because it, this is a midterm election, um, it, your vote is really going to matter a lot. So, so I think that's one thing to help people understand, that, that for the statewide races, um, every, every single citizen's vote contributes to the outcome of that election. Um, but then the other thing I would say, maybe at a deeper level, is that um, at least for me as a, as a woman of color, you know, my ancestors um, were not allowed to vote, or there were literacy tests, or they, you know, people risked their losing their jobs, and um, people really put their lives on the line for the right to vote, and, and I just feel that I have an obligation to honor that legacy, and to, and to not take it for granted, not take it for granted that I can vote without any of those current impediments. And so I would say remember our history and and honor those who struggled to make it possible for everyone to vote. Well, and, and, and really, I think what we've seen in the last several years is incredible energy. We've seen incredible energy. We see it uh, uh, teachers marching and educators marching. We see it with students marching. We see it with with, with women marching, we see with the March for Science, we see this incredible energy that is built and built and built. The way that translates into actual action is at the ballot box. And, and that's why the votes matter. That's why this midterm matters. Uh, and if, 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 if 2018 is, is, not, is not the year that we go to the ballot box, then you know I, I don't know when it will be. Um, and, and so this year maybe matters more than, more than any other, other year. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's really critical in this election that folks go vote 
there is a candidate in every legislative race on both sides of the ballot. And so there are folks to vote for. But as Anita said, even if your district is safe, a safely democratic district, if you don't go vote, Anita's not going to win. I'm not going to go back to the Court of Appeals and tell me that Legra is not going to win because it is critical that democratic voters go vote and that they vote all the way down the ballot. They find find their names on the ballot and vote and turn it over and learn about those constitutional amendments and vote on those as well. So it's absolutely critical. Your vote matters. Every vote matters in a statewide judicial race. Many times they are decided by less, they've been decided by less than a vote a precinct. So it's absolutely critical in each of those districts that you go vote, whether or not you think your legislative candidate is safe or you don't think your legislative candidate has an opportunity to win. It is absolutely critical to the four of us that you go vote. I'm going to sort of switch it up just a little bit because I always like to throw this out there. I hinted a, a, about it a little bit earlier. We're here in the gym, you know, and like you said, from Brunswick to Buncombe, it, yeah, you get a lot of reflection in it, but you're also <laughs> sitting on your rear for a very long time, okay? So what, is, what does it look like in terms of trying to stay healthy when, when you're engaged in this? And not just like getting in the gym, but also the sort of mental um, um, tenacity and, and fortitude and the strength that comes with being able to, to do this for so long. Well, it's uh, my trainer texted me the other day and said, am I ever going to see you again? <laughs> and obviously he hasn't seen me much lately. And, um, and it, is, it is difficult to get on a routine because you're supposed to be various, various places. And all these places have food, right? I mean, all so many of them. All these places have food and, and you're not getting as much sleep as you might should if you wanted to be really healthy and all of those things. But it is critical to to take care of yourself. And as I tell, I just had two interns who were leaving uh, today. It was their last day. And they were talking about where they were going to interview. And they were going to interview at big law firms. And I said, well, the one thing I would tell you is something that I'm probably not doing a very good job of right now is to have a work-life balance. And, and so it's, uh, but it, it is, it does, it is difficult, as I said, as my trainer said, am I ever going to see you again? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, from a, uh, from a health standpoint, I think it's just been really important for me to focus on diet because, you know, exercise has not been happening, but, but, but mentally I kind of draw from, uh, growing up I was a distance runner, um, you know, as a, as a miler cross country and, and ran marathons and so, I've sort of tried to put this 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 race uh, within that within that model and, and try and uh, try and shut out the noise, run my own race, uh, focus on what I what I can do at any given moment, and, and figure out the right pace at any given time. Uh, and so that's been really uh, helpful to me. And you know, and then frankly, you know, beyond that, it's uh, you know, this is uh, it's exhausting, but it's also the most energizing. Yeah. Thing I think I've ever done, and so you know, my head hits the pillow, and I'm out every night. Uh, eventually, at some point, when I get home. Uh, but the, you know, the mornings, you know, I'm ready to go again, and and that's that's been an incredible experience. And so I think that that's been been a huge takeaway for me. Ah, uh, I'm not healthy. <laughs> I've been done a very good job of exercise. Uh, Toby's probably it sounds like eating better than I have. So uh, I look forward to November 7th getting back on some sort of exercise <laughs> regimen. I have a long list of things to do on November 7th. Might ro roll into the 8th. So, but I think that I have relied so heavily on friends. Um, these three here, running with them, has been really wonderful. You know what you're going through together, uh, and that's been helpful. Uh, my husband has been an immense source of support. My parents have been fabulous. The students at Campbell Hall have been so excited that that's given me a lot of energy. Uh, you don't sometimes know how you're affecting people, uh, especially in the age of putting things on social media and right. people see it. So uh, I've just drawn 
energy from the people who have supported me, who come to events, who you meet out um, and about. And I think that mentally that ha always at some point recharges me no matter how tired I am. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting you mention that because that's sort of, it's sort of the internal support that, you know, and then there's sort of the external support, yeah. Well, I would say I have an, an amazing um, campaign team that keeps me going. They ask me if I've eaten yet, <laughs> um, so that's fantastic. But I would also say that it is a short, you know, we only have a short period of time, and so many people have um, come step forward to support my campaign, to volunteer, to take their time on a Saturday and go knock on doors for me. And so I just feel that, you know, I have to give it my all. Like, I'm, it, I'm leaving nothing at I'm going to put it all out there and do everything I possibly can until the election. Yeah, it's sort of like, uh, well, it, okay, so we've all been in the situation where we had to take the bar exam, and <laughs> as I told my husband going into that, I'm giving it my all now because I'm only taking it once. <laughs> there is no way I'm ever doing this again, and so it's like, here's the schedule, and then this is the way it is, so yeah, sometimes um, you have to change up and understand that for this moment in time, I'm going to work on the internal piece, the external piece, but here's the plan, and there is an end date. So yeah, yeah. But, it, but it's incredible how when you're when you're motivated. Oh yeah. To to do it when you're excited about it when you have a passion for what uh, you're shooting for what your goal is. It, you know you, you do it. You find a way. Yeah. To do somewhere it. it comes from within, and that's you right. just it, it, yeah. That's right. Excellent. And so and that's and you know and, and like Legra, I've been incredibly inspired by, by by these three and to see their passion and energy as they've gone around the state and certainly um, you know, kept me going. And I, too, have a wonderful campaign manager who's on the end of my text, in my phone call, <laughs> on the other side of the desk, constantly listening, motivating, understanding, supporting. So I think we all have people close to us that, that have helped us continue. Probably to try to wrap up here, but I want to give each of you a moment to sort of say whatever it is you want to say, whatever it is you want to share, um, final thoughts. Reminding people, of course, to go out to vote as soon as the first day of early vote starts, because we're into that now. But yeah, I'll, I'll start and just say thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. This has been really fun. It's mm -hmm. been fun to sit down and talk through some of these uh, these interesting topics, and uh, I've enjoyed it. And uh, I just I thank everybody who's out there who has supported me and who will support me. And please go out and vote uh, for the four of us. And uh, and. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come talk. Um, folks, if you want to learn more about my campaign, you can go to my website, keepjudgearrowood.org, and I would encourage you to do that, and I would encourage you to be educated because it is absolutely critical that we have judges who are experienced and who are independent and who have a record of being able to do the things that you need judges to do. I, I think for me, the, the message is, you know, this is a blue moon election. Every race here matters up and down the ballot from, from the state house uh, to the courthouse. And I think it's absolutely vital uh, that you get out, you vote, uh, vote early if you can, but on election day, if not, uh, you know, these judicial races are incredibly important this year. And we've heard the term, uh, a justice election. Well, let's make it a justice election. Let's do that up and down the ballot, voting for good candidates who will stand for justice, uh, as I know all, all four of us will. Uh, you can find more about me at tobyhampsonforjudge.com or find me on Facebook at tobyhampson4nc. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, I, my specific ask is that you uh, like my Facebook page, which is Anita Earls for Justice. My website is earls4justice.com, and there you can sign up to volunteer and be a part of my campaign. Um, and please share this uh, with your friends and um, follow me on Twitter as well. Thanks. Awesome. And Twitter is like not my thing. So did you give your web? Did you give yours? No, so you should let me go last. <laughs> they all have the good ideas. <laughs> so they all got theirs in. Yeah. Right. I noticed that. And I was like, wait, I don't think Allegra did hers. She was going to save me. So AllegraCollins.com. You can 
find me on uh, Instagram at Allegra Collins for Court of Appeals. You can find me on Facebook at Allegra Collins for Court of Appeals. Probably if you Google Allegra Collins, there aren't It'll many come of them. up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, it's been great having you here, and um, yeah, I don't know that there's anything much more to say other than, again, thank you, Patrick and Sam, for letting us come hang out in the gym so that people could learn more about our candidates who are running for these judicial seats. Um, this is, it's a very important election, not saying that any of the others that go on aren't. But um, we just need to, here's my thing, I always tell people, like the judges get no love, okay? <laughs> Our judges get no love, so this is all about judge love. So going forward, anybody who's watching this, okay, and they want to comment about any race, I want you to hashtag judge love. <laughs> so show our judges some love, share this with everyone because we want to have a formed voter population out there that is going to come out and vote as soon as early voting starts because it's important. Awesome. Thank awesome. You. So you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. And of course, oh, I forgot to say thank you, Emerson, from behind the camera. She's working two cameras. She's been to Chick fil A. She's been to Jersey Mike's. And she's doing homework. So thanks to you. And I think we're good. That's right. I didn't talk about. That's right. I'm just going to tell my problems. That's, that's right. right. Thank you. That's right. And, 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 no, but that's precisely it. Because the more people you meet, and the more people you talk to, and the more people who hear your story and understand why you're right, like the more people who hear what's truly in your heart, then none of that other stuff matters, like ever. It never matters. So it's that relationship building, I think, is what takes us beyond all of the noise. Yeah. yeah. It's just hard when this is. It is. It is. It is. Oh, yeah. It's like.